Hi, my name is Karen McMullen and I'm the Features Programmer at Doc NYC. I'm very pleased to welcome today directors Malia Sharp and Max Bash to talk about their film, Kenny Sharp, When Worlds Collide. Welcome, Malia and Max. How are you? Thank you. We're happy to be here with you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your film with Doc NYC. So it's a good one. Um, so let's jump into our Q&A, talking about um, this great film. So, as everyone knows, in the 1980s, uh, Kenny Sharp was a major force in the East New York downtown art scene. Um, and he, you know, right now he's at the forefront of where pop culture and fine art meet. Um, can you talk about how you came to do this project? Yeah, so... Um... So I, I think when I was about, so I'm Kenny's daughter, for in case some people didn't know when they watched the film. And I believe I was about 20, I think I was about 20, so about almost 11, 21, let's say, 11 years ago, I decided I wanted to make a film about Kenny and I had no idea <laughs> what it really meant to make this film about my father. And what truly um, inspired me to want to go to make this film is really the community that he had in New York um, in the t at the time he arrived, which was late 70s, early 80s. And I was always very nostalgic, um, wanting some sort of community like that of support and artists, um, just a completely different New York than we are in today. Um, so that, that was kind of the beginning. And then of course, growing up with Kenny being just, a, you know, living in a completely different world than any of the other people I knew in my life. Um, and then Max came on about a, de a half, like half a decade into it, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I don't know. When did I, I mean, like, I met Malia probably in 2014, and she had been carrying the project for quite some time. And, uh, you know, it hadn't really fully fleshed out into any, um, it wasn't, there was no like long, the longest cut you had at that point was maybe like 10 minutes or something, right? But they'd done a lot of work. So they'd done a lot of interviews. So there was like this wealth of material that they had accumulated. And um, we just sort of became friends. And then she started to introduce me to the project and like these little slow little uh, teasers. She just started to show me some of the archival. And that was kind of what sold me was like, you know, I, I didn't know much about Kenny prior to that. And then, you know, she kind of um, just uh, continued to show me these little bits and pieces that she had because being his daughter, she had access to all of this material. So, you know, she had just this amazing archive and um, I was really struck by it and struck by kind of like the challenge of what it meant to try to make a feature because we both had never made features before. This is our first, um, you know, this sort of directorial feature debut. And yeah, it was kind of just like this crazy project that felt uh, like this massive puzzle. And um, I was like, yeah, I, I don't think I knew fully what I was signing up for. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, we kind of just went for it and, um, took the bull by the horns and I mean, I, yeah, the thing that really struck me was the archive and then just learned, the more I learned about Kenny, the more I was sort of fascinated by his story and by the community and all that entailed. Well, he's certainly a fascinating character. Um, Malia, what were the challenges, um, and perks to doing a film about your father? Well, for me, I believe, you know, I feel the challenge was really being so close to the subject because I'm also very close to my father. Um, and being, I think, a young woman, <laughs> also just having it be my first film. And I was just, I had to learn through doing it, you know, I, and so the challenge was being so close to the subject not really having much support really to just doing it all ourselves um, and standing just the test of time because, you know, carrying a project and really saying, no, I'm, this, I'm going to finish this. Like, I don't care how long or how hard it is. So, 
So over 11 years, it's a very long time. So it was the time aspect, the closeness to the subject, and then just being like, okay, you're like, go for it. You, you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure out how to make this work. Has, um, has your father seen the film yet? Yes. I, has he seen this version? I don't know if he's seen like the, like the colored and like the, with the sound mix, you know, but he saw the, the film, I think, and it's in, in, the, in the version that it's in. He hasn't seen it all like, you know, buttoned up like it is right now, but he's seen the cut, yeah. Yeah. How much, um, how much, if any, influence did he have, or input rather, on the final cut? He really was completely removed from this whole process. I mean, aside from me, Wes following him with the camera, but he really did not have much input. Yeah, he was so hands off. I mean, but that's kind of like, I mean, Kenny's like, he's so focused on what he's doing. It's like, you know, if he were making the film or involved in the film, he would have probably been involved like from beginning to end, you know? So I feel like with him, it's kind of all or nothing and uh, for, he just trusted Malia, you know, he supported, you know, her vision of it, I think. And um, I think he was pleasantly surprised, you know, he was kind of just like, you know, you kids are having fun, you know, that was kind of the vibe for a while, just sort of hands off. And um, yeah, you know, I was surprised by that too when I stepped in because I'd never met him. I didn't know how much um, influence he would have over the project and um, yeah. Uh, Kenny's full of surprises though, but um, yeah, he was pretty hands off. He seems like he would be full of surprises and um, fun. He seems like he would be a fun guy. Um, but one of the things that really strikes me is the lack of pretentiousness that, that he has, and it's in his art and it's in his de demeanor and he's in his home. Um, and also the generosity, the fact that he's on the one hand in, the, in fine in museums and in fine art galleries, but he's also willing to do some graffiti on the back of somebody's shirt. You know, I think it's the generosity of spirit is great. But I'm sure that came at some financial costs. Can you talk about what this, you know, lack of creating this persona that's above it all and this generosity, you know, like this giving away his art that's meant for him financially? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, so growing up in that world with him, I, I got to witness and be a part of that struggle. And, um, you know, it's like the art world and then the artists and Kenny through and through really is, um, that, that was a struggle, like you said, like that, that was um, a struggle at many points in the career because there wasn't really a attention to that and the, the putting a lot of energy into that, um, into the business realm, right? So was, I think that was- Yeah, I mean, I, I would add to that by saying, you know, I think that Kenny represents kind of like this unique sort of figure in, in the art world and you touched on it a little bit, which is, you know, he, but there is, you know, and we, we touch on this in the film as well, but there's this, this kind of preciousness about fine art, you know, and, and Kenny has this way of just, you know, part of his message, which connects back to Keith and back to, you know, his roots, which is like, you know, art is for everyone, you know, like that's what his MO kind of is. And so it's kind of this fine line that you have to sort of balance between in the art world, because you know, if you give your art away, then that, you know, has a direct in implication on the value of it, you know, like, uh, and so I think that, you know, that's something that's really powerful about Kenny as a character is, is he, yes, he needs to survive and make a living selling his art. And so there needs to be, um, you know, a certain type of, uh, like, preciousness about it. But then at the same time, whenever he has an opportunity, you know, he is painting on someone's jacket who's coming by or he's creating, you know, a custom thing for a fan that, you know, they just have this, this rally in LA. I don't know if you saw this, but he does these car bombs, you know, like we kind of touch on it briefly in the film, but like anyone who wants their car tagged by Kenny, they can come in for free. He'll, he'll, he'll paint, he'll spray paint on their car and draw these, you know, fantastical figures of his. And, you know, that kind of does take away from, 
uh, you know, what the art world, you know, I think a, a lot of artists kind of, you know, they have to protect their imagery and there has to be, you know, a certain value associated with it. And when you give things away for free, you know, that can like degrade that value. So that's something that doesn't affect him. And I think, um, yeah, it's like this lack of pretentiousness, it's this, just it's this drive. Spirit. It's yeah. like he, he has to be true to his spirit. You see in, the, in his work, he's been criticized, you know, it's like, that's his spirit. That's how he lives. Um, and I, that's the beauty. That's what's so inspiring to me as well as the generosity in that, that that is just who he is. And so it's easy <laughs> because mm -hmm. it comes from a true place of, you know, like his loving and giving his art in that way when he, when he can. Yeah. And he's, he's always been um, pretty fearless in um, being out of step with the mainstream, um, which has engendered some vicious backlash you know, from the people out there. Has that ever, you know, can you talk about how that has affected his desire to paint? In well, creative? yeah, I mean, one thing about Kenny is like, he has never stopped painting. So no matter what, how hard times got, how much criticism, the painting just, that was his through line. That was what fed him throughout um, the challenges. And so, uh, I feel like, I feel like it's just, he was literally born, he was, he, he was given the gift where he was able to paint at a young age and he just never stopped. And so that was like, just the strength um, that kept him going. What was, what was the other part of the question? I feel like. Just if, uh, if the negative feedback or the backlash had any effect on him. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oops. Um, I think that as he got older with time, um, that wasn't as painful. But I know as he was working uh, alongside his colleagues or his friends, Keith and Basquiat, and he was, you know, maybe at a level not at that fame. Um, I know it was challenging, but the, the art just never, he just never stopped. Um, and that, that is, he just never stopped painting, but for sure. And you see moments of it in the film, you see where he admits like, yeah, this was hard for me. And um, as he's gotten older, he's just stronger and stronger in his vision, his work. He like, he, things just slide off his back for the most part now, where I think when he was younger, not so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he also, now more than ever i mean he's you know he's sort of he's 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 continuing to ascend you know his career is like he had he had a moment where he really struggled i think in the 90s where maybe if we were filming more at that point you know we have some you know some footage in the 90s but um you know i wonder how he would have been like in an interview in the 90s um and and whether or not you would have seen more of this kind of uh this bitterness maybe, you know, like I think that he probably was bitter at certain times, but he's, he's a mercurial kind of character, you know, like people sort of love him or they hate him kind of. And like, he's, he's learned to just kind of accept that and roll with that. I feel like to a certain extent, and he really just stands true to himself. And I think that's a really admirable thing about any artist. It's like something to really take away. Absolutely. Um, I had a question about his using like Hanna Barbera cartoons. Are there any proprietary issues around that? You know, I, I don't think so. Yeah, he's been able to get away with it by changing it in his art. By yeah, I mean, like there's like all sorts of copyright laws that I feel like they. I, I don't think they've ever gotten into a major suit, and I feel like um, it's it's because of the way that a lot of copyright law exists and he manipulates the images enough that they have never had issue. And now he does, you know, partnerships with a lot of cartoon companies, you know what I mean? There um, might have been some issues, but not big enough where I can remember. Yeah, they've never stopped him from painting those characters. Yeah. And that was so much his language of like how he would use his work. He could make, he, had, he could have a good argument for it. <laughs> Yeah, the Hanna-Barbera Hanna stuff is, uh, again, like in the film, I mean, 
trying to remember if we touched on this. I think we do, but maybe not so explicitly, but you know, he's always been obsessed with like the past and the future. So like the Hanna-Barbera stuff, uh, and it's about like sort of the marriage of these two worlds. So, you know, the Flintstones represent this like version of ourselves in the, in the past, sort of our typical sort of past versions of ourselves and the Jetsons are like this future version of ourselves. And I think that that is something that you see in a lot of his work and you see, you know, uh, it, it's this kind of sort of blended reality where you have the past and the future together um, as one. And, and that's something that I think you see a lot in his work too, which is, you know, now we're not talking about the film, we're just talking about his art, but, you know, uh, that's something that we try to flesh out in the film is uh, showing, you know, throughout his career, this sort of, this obsession with like sort of opposites and sort of combining opposites and how he can, you know, incorporate um, just a lot of universal ideas into one painting, yeah, stuff like that. And what's next for the film? Well, we hope that it gets to be seen all <laughs> over the world. <laughs> I really, I really feel it's an inspiring film, even for these times. Um, staying true to yourself, you know, the environment, just some, just like, I, I feel like it brings hope. Um, so I really hope that it gets to be shared and seen. We're going to be sharing at a few festivals. I'm not sure that there have been announced yet. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, more festivals and then theaters. I mean, it'd be awesome if like, you know, theaters come back around. We'll see what happens. But I mean, I would love to watch the film, you know, with friends in theaters and, um, you know, it'd be great to, you know, potentially have a little theatrical around with the film. But yeah, we, you know, we're, we're trying to get it out there. We're trying for people to see it. We're excited about Doc NYC. We're excited about other festivals that, you know, are showing the film and, um, that, that's that's all that we can ask for is that people see it. Yeah, well, I, I hope you get your wish because, you know, that artwork would really sing on a big screen. Um, it sings on the small screen, so it would be even greater big. Thank you very much. We're going to wrap up our Q&A. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. And thank you very much for sharing your wonderful film with us, Malia and Max. I'm um, Karen McMullen. And that's it for this Q&A. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. It's so nice to speak with you about it.